Welcome to the channel and this introduction video for a new series for Workers and Resources Soviet Republic. Now I'm aware many people do not like long introductions and so I want to emphasize there will be absolutely no gameplay in this video. So if you want to get into the gameplay what I recommend is that you move forward onto the part one video which will be released at exactly the same time as this introduction video. If you decided to stay, welcome. This video will consist of three parts. In the first part, I'm just going to talk about the new series in, and what the objectives are going to be. In the second part, we're going to talk about setting up the actual game parameters. And that will also lead into some of the criteria that I will be using in, in this series. And then the final section, I'll be giving you a tour of the Great Divide custom map. So we might as well now move on to part one and what the objectives of this series is going to be. Hopefully the objective of this series actually stems from the previous series where I was building on quite a difficult map with very limited space. The challenge was great, but one of the drawbacks of it was the fact that I wasn't really able to truly explore the mechanics of the game. And that actually led me to start looking at lots of custom maps with a view to finding a map that would give me a reason to build a fully self-sufficient society that includes all the mechanics in the game. And when I mean mechanics in the game, I'm talking about trains, uh, ships, planes now with the new update, also tourism. The idea is, is to bind all these together and actually create a, a fully self-sufficient society. And if any of you watched the My Wind Up video for the last series, you'll be aware that I, I talked about a couple of points which I, I wanted to investigate further and that is to make the economy fully self-sufficient with respect to crops because the, the single um, harvest per year introduced by the seasons update has made that into quite an interesting challenge especially considering the number of industries that are dependent on crop production. The other thing I really want to sort out in the in this series is building a very effective distribution system and once we get onto the tour of the map what you will see is that the way the resources are positioned and the terrain will really require a very efficient distribution system to make it all come together just to recap what the objective of this series is to build a fully self-sufficient society including all the mechanics of the game and if any of you have followed my previous series you will know that I always play on the, the harder, harder difficulties and I always have the principle that I build everything. I don't use auto purchase either for resources or for buildings. So what we're going to be doing is, is starting in one location and then spreading out across the map. Although I do have an idea of maybe we can do a variation of that. But I will talk a bit more about that in part one of the series. So I think what we can do now is just come into here and you can see the sheer number of custom maps that I've been looking at and I've, I've done test plays on the vast majority of them there's one or two that I haven't quite got round to and what I say is that they're all very good maps and they all present different challenges but none of them really fulfilled what I was looking for for this series I mean the confluence map is is a pretty good challenge and it's quite interesting to play on the same with Singapore 2 here this has got a quite a nice river system but at the same time, it just wasn't right. And quite often with these maps, what put me off slightly, is, and I don't mean, mean that in a nasty way, was the position of the resources. It was either too little or too much. I have to confess, I am completely obsessed with custom maps, and I'm always checking the workshop to see when new ones are coming in. And again, if you want something that's a totally different challenge, Kentucky Grad can be quite fun. There's not a lot of space on the map. You've really got to think about what you're doing, because you can see from the textures here, it's all hills. If I come through here, Chilean Poplar Republic um, is an interesting map as well, especially and also North Korea if you really want to join up um, settlements over fairly rough terrain. Now the Baltic Islands map has been recommended to me. Apologies, I can't remember who actually recommended it to me now. And I will say that I will be doing this map sometime in the future because it's a very interesting map. It's a very different challenge from my perspective because I've up until now I've never really ever played on a populated map also this terrain is very flat and there's a big emphasis on using ships in the early game the, my big challenge and possibly something I'm going to need to think about is whether I'm going to be able to 
adapt my style of gameplay of building everything to that map but that's going to be a challenge for the future and the map we're actually going to be using is called the great divide this is a custom map that i've created it will be available in the workshop for anybody who wants to follow the playthrough or just wants to take a look at the map from themselves and i'm going to be completely honest this map was originally started out as an exercise in learning how to use the terrain editor and also how to merge imported terrain maps in a way that could greatly reduce the amount of work you needed to do to create a, a custom map and the map we're actually going to be using is the great divide this is a custom map that i've adapted is probably the correct term for this series because originally it started out as purely as an exercise in creating custom maps in workers and resources soviet republic it was never really intended to actually use this on a let's play what actually happened was is that when the the, up, the most recent update was released in december the idea that is driving this series started to form in my head about having a map that would present the challenges that would get the player to use every mechanic in the game whilst building a self-sufficient economy so what i did then is decided to start adapting the the map to those requirements and this is what's resulted in the great divide although i have to be honest that most of the main features were already in place i just needed to do some changes adjust the resources for what i wanted to do and also in the context of the the new update so this is the map we're going to be playing on and of course we're going to select the map and what we're going to do now is set up the game parameters and of course i always play on hard one of the, the interesting things about this game is if say if i drop this down to medium see what it actually does is it switches off the game mechanics which means that if you go down to easy you're really only playing on half the game so even if you're new to the game what you what you want to do is ignore the fact that this is overall difficulty is go for hard and then customize it so for like example so for example i'm going to start on hard here but if you're a completely new player just come down to easy then you've got you have a big pile of cash to build things with and it's the same also with the when you talk about the citizens reaction if you don't want to play on but very hard you can come down to medium what i would recommend though is if, you, if you're new to the game and you want to learn how to play this game always keep the energy management on building some vehicles and the education on complex simply because if you do play on the easier settings of these when you do decide to come up to these you, you're effectively going to have to relearn the game so what we're going to do is get this back in the right position for me I always play on hard happiness we also have the energy management building some vehicles now i am going to turn off the day night cycle this is purely due to the fact of making videos for youtube because the night cycle was incredibly dark it just makes it very difficult to um, make the videos and, and of course from the viewing perspective you can't see anything because there's now the cheat mode that allows us to turn the night and day cycle on i believe what I will be doing is building my towns and cities up with respect to the fact that there is a day and night cycle. And once we've got reasonable towns that can have a very good visual effect at night, so we'll all be able to take a look at how the the towns look in the dark. And of course, that also adds the additional issue of the extra power consumption that occurs during the night cycle. And of course, we're going to be playing the seasons on. Again, for any new players, what I'd recommend is that you do not play with seasons enabled. Start with seasons disabled because the seasons introduces some, some fairly difficult challenges with respect to keeping your population alive due to the fact that you need heating. Also, the issue that I've already touched on in part of the initial introduction is uh, the actual farming because the difference between having seasons enabled and disabled is if you've got season disabled your farms will produce two possibly three crops a year if you have it enabled what will happen is you only get one crop a year so moving down to probably one of the one mechanic in this option screen you either like or hate and i'll be completely honest I have very mixed feelings about um, building fires. I, I, I find them incredibly annoying, but at the same time, if they're not there, I miss them. So I have this kind of love-hate relationship with building fires. That's the reason why I actually leave it on frequent. And of course, one of the things I want to do is enable global vents. This is a new feature with the um, airplanes and, and tourism update. And I certainly want to see how global effects are going to impact on the economy. Again, pollution 
is one of those mechanics you either love or hate. To be honest, I, I, now I've got the feel for the way pollution works. I, I, I actually quite enjoy playing it, but again, word for anyone who's a new player, it might be useful just to turn this off, but be aware that if you do play with pollution switched off and then you decide to switch it on, the way you lay out your industry in relation to residential areas could uh, give you a few problems. Years start, we're going to start in 1960 because um, there's a good chance we'll be up way past 2000 by the time this series ends. Miracle availability, we're set to all, uh, not all, lock according to year, I think. Yeah, um, I nearly made a mistake there. Education, again, similar to energy management. If you, even if you're a new player, what I suggest you do is, is always play on complex because if you actually show the difference here, if you play on simple, it says children automatically reach basic age education and you don't need to build kindergartens. Complex just means that you've got to educate your children at school and you've got to build kindergartens. And to be honest, this is a relatively simple mechanic to get your head round and learn because you've still got to provide the advanced education to get the skill of your workers up so that you can get teachers and engineers. Therefore, even for a completely new player, this isn't a particularly difficult mechanic to get your head around. And I think that's about it. So what we're going to do now is just zap the button and I'll see you on the map. Welcome to the map. And you can see we start with a very close up view of a tree. I'm just going to pause the game because I don't want to lose any game time while I do this overview. And what I'm going to do is open up the mini map. And the reason we get a very close up view of the tree is simply because when you start a new map, the cursor is always placed in the center at a certain height. And of course, in the case of the, the, this map, the center is quite high terrain in because there's this great divide that splits the map into two halves. And so I'm just going to zoom out just to give you a bit of view. The other drawback is if I get up too high, all we're going to see is clouds. Now, the way I'm going to do this part of the video is I'm going to use the mini map to give a general overview of the layout of the map and talk about some of the, the features generally. Then I'm going to dive in and take a closer look at some of the features that are both going to add and hinder the progress in this series. Then I'm going to move on and talk about the resource placement and what that will do is bring into context some of the features of the map and also talk a little bit about the challenges of getting access to those resources. And then just to wind up the video, I will talk about the starting location for this series and a strategy which may help to make the series go a bit quicker. Let's just talk about the map now. As I've previously mentioned, this map originally started out as an exercise in just learning how to use the terrain editor. So what I actually did is I went out and grabbed a number of features from various parts of the world and put them onto the map and then tried to rearrange them to put them into a context that made sense. Now, since the release of the last update on in December, what I've actually done is shuffled this around a bit. But the main theme of the map remains true. It is a completely fictitious map, but it is based on a couple of structures in real life. And probably the best way to explain it is if you look at the way the river is laid out, the actual headland that sticks out here is very similar to the headland up here. And the reason for that is that the overall structure of the map is actually based on Southampton, because Southampton is, is quite an unusual city in the sense that what you've got is the main part of the city is built on a headland, which is divided by two rivers. And then, of course, what you get down coming out of here is Southampton Water. And if you look up in the top left hand corner, you actually see I've imported Southampton Water. And the, the little bit that juts out in this square here is where Southampton would be. So if you can imagine if that was turned round, that would emulate the two rivers coming together on, in this larger area here. And for anyone who lives in the south of England, the the river coming down into the navigable river that crosses right from the top left to the bottom right is the Itchin. The small river that runs into here is the Test. And up here, you've actually got Beauty River. And then, of course, to keep the theme going, if you look down in the bottom right hand corner, anyone who lives in the south of England might recognize this island. It's actually Portsmouth. And above it, you've got a modified version of Langston Harbour with a very characteristic narrow entrance with some very fast tidal runs. And of course, below that, you've got 
a slightly filled in version of Portsmouth Harbour here where I've, what I've actually done here is I've actually widened the entrance into Portsmouth Harbour here and the and the overall concept is to have a couple of flat coastal areas on on this side of the map connected by uh, the sea which will allow ships to move goods up between these two areas and also we got this navigable river which will allow goods to be shipped across the map and I think this is something I want to emphasize from the very beginning that the way this map's been put together is to put slight more emphasis on the use of ships and aircraft to move goods between the two parts of the map and that would be even more relevant once I talk about where the resources are that's not to say that there aren't ways that you can get between the two parts using road and rail but in the spirit in this map that uh, the idea was is to give a reason to use ships and planes because in the past series that I've played the ships have always been something to ex export bulk goods to the outside not I've never really used them that much within the internal map because there's never been much reason for anyone else who's interested in the terrain i'll probably be easier to explain it once we go in so what we're going to do is we're going to start by looking at the what you could call the main feature of the map just going to drag the mini map down and what you see here is we've got this great big headland which runs into effectively a spine of high hills i won't call them mountains which runs right across the center of the map for anyone's interested this is actually a headland in Norway and in real life it has fields on each side but what I've actually done is, is blended the terrain in but I just really like the shape of this headland and the way it actually came out when it was imported now it's slightly exaggerated because of the way terrain maps work now if anyone's not familiar with terrain maps is the, the lighter the color the higher it is and the darker the color it is the lower it is so if you want deep water you effectively paint the map black if you want incredibly high mountains you paint in patches of white but when you import terrain maps in you often get a very jagged effect especially when you've got multiple terrain maps that may have slightly different uh colorings to them one thing i will say is that the all these features are quite heavily edited after they've been placed in order to blend them in but i really just like this idea of maybe having this kind of bump on the front here and more importantly behind this headland was this was a fairly flat area that effectively raised itself up above the surrounding terrain and i've actually called it cloud rock and for and this will be an interesting feature once i actually start talking about resources now if i follow through you can see that what I've actually done is is smooth through accentuated some valleys and also put in a couple of new cut through valleys like this to provide a way across. And if I follow this through, trying to avoid the clouds, you'll see we've actually got the navigable river running up this side. Then it cuts through here. And this lake here actually comes from a flooded valley in Switzerland. I've got a feeling that it was a dam at one end. But I really like this, so I pulled this out. And dropped it in the center i think this is one of the interesting things you can do when you build your own custom maps is by just by pulling out various features from around the world and dropping them in if i come up into here now this is a a series of mountains from norway which i've actually softened down into hills but what i really liked was the linear direction of this and if i remember correctly from my geography lessons this is actually the result of glaciation where the glaciers came over during the ice age moving in a certain direction and they cut through the softer rock and they left the harder rock higher creating this slightly stratified approach to the hills and i must admit i really like that feature that's why it's on the map and up here we've got this valley which is going to be quite an important feature for the series but again i'm going to talk more about that when we go to resources and then over here we got this area i've called hidden valley and I want to emphasize that some of these features were put in before I started refining the map for the actual series. These were put in just as features with me playing around with the map terrain just for the fun of it. And then if I follow this through here, what you see is we've got a kind of four way junction between valleys here. This actually came from North America. I can't remember where in North America it was because at the time I was looking for Mises. And I saw this feature here and I thought, well, this would fit in really well. And again, in real life, the terrain is a lot higher and the, the the valleys are a lot deeper, but I've softened them down to fit into the context of the map. And what you've got here is a valley running this way, which again is going to be quite significant. And then we've got this slightly deeper valley, which runs out to a connection here. 
Now, I might not even bother to connect up to this area here, but for anyone who wants to play on this map, wants a really tough challenge, this could be something to look at. And then what I've got up through here is a, a, a high valley which runs through into this area here. Now, this area here is the product of importing several terrain maps of Mises. I can't remember what state is it, Mises are actually in. Is it Arizona? Apologies if I get the state wrong. And so what I did is I got three Mises, and we got one coming up here and one here. And then the original layout for here was a Mises, which I've then re-sculpted been with Portsmouth for Harbour. And the idea was is to come up through here in a series of steps. So we got a escarpment along here, which rises up onto this flat area here. And the low foothills here are used to blend the true terrain maps together. And then we got another flat mesa like area here, which is cut by the gorge on this side. Now, originally, this was a lot more rougher. But what I've actually done is flatten this down as a potential site for a city and an airport. And of course, what we got here is a pair of gates. I think this came from somewhere in Colorado. And, and probably the best way to show it is if I come in and show you this connection here. This is a, I think it's a medium connection with a single road, a single rail. If I turn around, you see that the hills form a ring round and there's this gateway through. And when I saw this feature, I thought, yeah, this is, I really like this feature and it's got to be on the map. And I think it makes this start a little bit more interesting because in the starting in this area, you build a town and you're effectively directed out through this area here into this larger area where you could build a larger town. Now, all this area through here is purely me practicing with the, the terrain editor. And I have to admit, compared to some other games, I actually like the terrain editor provided with this game. It does have its quirks, especially when you try to set the level limits. But overall, I think it's a very good job as a terrain editor for creating custom maps. And I think that's probably enough of a general tour of the map and what I'm going to do now is talk about the resources because the resources will pull these features together and put them into context but what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to give you a general overview of the resources are then I'm going to talk about specific locations and if I start with coal you will now see another reason why this map is called the great divide because the coal and the iron in the lower section of the map oil is in the upper section of the map and if I come down to uranium, you see uranium's in its own unique location in on one side of the map. Now, originally, before the update was released, this these the position of the bulk site was was where the uranium was. But when I restructured the resources in the context of the new update, I decided to move all the uranium over into its own special valley. And what I'll be doing is taking a look at that and explaining a bit more why it's actually there. Now, if I go back to coal, I'm aware that some experienced players may look at this and think, ah, he's trying to make it easy for himself. He's got great big deposits of coal, especially in the center of the map. Well, I hate to disappoint you, but yes, there are lots of coal in the center of the map. There's also big patches of iron in the center of the map as well, but it comes with a fairly heavy sting, which I will explain. But what I'm going to do first is talk about this start down in this corner here, which I would probably call the the steel magnet start because what you've actually got is if i show you the coal the coal is actually located out of here so while the coal is close is there's no going to be easy charge out here to get the coal and of course that also applies with the iron because if i come up here the iron is actually in this valley here and if you remember we've got the four-way valley here so the iron is actually located in this area here so there's a lot of iron but to bring the coal and iron together to build a steel industry, it's going to have to be brought out of this valley, probably into this area. And this is probably the strategy that I'm going to take is build a steel town here, which will then be able to distribute the steel to various parts of the map. And of course, that hints at the fact of why I would want an airport here as well. So there's a very real possibility if we bring them in, is that we'll have the st a steel town here, which will then fly the steel over to the top parts of the map as the economy grows. But of course, there's also the option to bring a rail line down to this area here and use shipping. And of course, we've got our little harbour 
in this area here but if i come to over here the lake some of you may have spotted it there's this little straight section here where there's potential to build uh, a couple of harbors here which will then allow ships to move the the uh, the oars out of here to the various development areas and i think that leads into now the coal and iron in this area here now the iron is in this area here you can see it's deliberately on a shelf separated from this big area by this gorge here now this gorge has got no other purpose than except to provide a division on the map there's no reason why you'd want to bring ships up through here because it doesn't go anywhere and it's also got the very steep sides now i will apologize for the textures i i have tried to merge some of them in like this but what i found was if i took the gorges too wide you won't you can't span them with power cables and therefore and i didn't really want to cut the map up from a power supply perspective because i would like to build a fully unified grid the other thing i will say is that these gorges are deliberately wide enough to stop the use of conveyors and pipelines which is an attempt to, to constrain me from building a massive uh, gravel supply line right across the map so we got the iron here and then of course this valley which i pointed out which i was saying was i really liked the actual coal is at the head of this valley up in here and you can see there's enough space up here to build several coal mines possibly get a town to supply the workforce but of course you've got this sharp drop off here so there's no quick fix to build a coal mine here and then export it out through here and of course if i go the other side the, there's a fair amount of rough terrain here to prevent any quick fixes coming out this way so what this means is if i'm going to open up this area here the coals could have to be shipped down here probably by conveyor to a port here which will then send the coal or iron out on on the map now there is a small area here where i could build a town but most likely when i build a town here it will be to provide the workforce to the iron mines here now if i move across to cloud rock and again what you see is there's massive deposits of coal and iron here the only drawback is it's right up on the top of this mound <laughs> and there is no obvious way of getting up here now i'm going to put my hand up and say i do know the way how to get up here but i'm not going to tell you until i actually develop it in in my series because i will be opening this area up the one clue i will say is if you look carefully here you can see that this side's been slightly molded to possibly give conveyor access up this side of the mountain the other thing i will mention while i'm going through this anyone who wants to look at this map and maybe get a few hints is i've deliberately put names on the map that give hints to possible solutions such as like the doors of durin here anyone who's read lord of the rings mail will probably understand the significance of that and why these little patches of uh, gravel are or rock are put here now we're going to talk about the oil so if i come up to here now anyone who's an experienced player knows that there is a little bit of an exploit with being able to get gain access to oil fields and make quite a lot of money in the early game i was aware of that when i put this in this is the reason why all the oils on this side of the river so in order to be able to gain access to the oil if i started here i'd have to bridge the river which can be a little bit of a challenge but the reason i've actually done this is that should someone who wants to use this map to maybe learn to play the game this provides a good starting area nice and flat there's some gravel up in here which can be easily exploited and if you're actually auto purchasing your items with a large reserve of cash it's relatively easy to throw a bridge over here gain access to the oil and set up an industry to make a quite a large sum of money also the another feature of this area is the nato connection over here so so, so it's possible in this similar corner of the map to get a fairly early dual income going which again plays to the needs of a new player needless to say i'm not going to be starting in this area now one tip i will give is there are a couple of points along this river where you can actually put power lines and more importantly pipelines across the other thing you need to remember that if you do start to put pipelines and across this river you may block it with respect to using it for shipping and as I say, all the oils up here, if I, and the, most of it is marked by swamps. 
So if I come up over here, let me just see if I can find it. You see there's a swamp here where there's another oil field. The only downside of this area is that some of the oil is actually off the map. I think that there is a lot of potential to get a very big oil industry going. So I've put another little patch in roughly about here. And the reason for these patches of oils is to allow a small oil supply to be fed into this area in the event that maybe someone who really wants a very hard start and really fancies build on a large flat area and they want to go for a NATO start. I would say from a perspective of somebody who wants to play this map, this is probably the hardest start. And of course, what we got here is deep water here, isolating this island. This island is purely fictitious. I built this with the text editor. And what I did is I put this quirky island in here called Whale Island because I just didn't want to put a round blob in. And it is here for a purpose. And for anyone who is experienced with the game, I'll just say electricity. And what I've done is I've created this valley here. So I said originally this was built for uranium but now it actually contains the bauxite and the reason i've put a patch of bauxite up here is to be able to put in the capacity to make aluminium in, in the event that it may be in the later of the series i will want to build an airline production area here one thing you need to bear in mind is i'm talking about where things could go but i haven't actually made a final decision on how I'm going to do this is it's not all pre-planned what I've just done is is laid out resources that will give me options and if we go to the other bauxite area which is down here this is put in very specifically again with the possibility of setting up aircraft manufacture over here but also it's here to possibly give an early source of exports in the form of aluminium if you can either get it down to here or more or up through here Although, to be honest, I'd say that this is probably the easier option. And of course, there's only one more resource to talk about, which is uranium ore, which is up here in Hidden Valley. Now, this uranium ore was deliberately put up here for a reason. That is that the in the last series, when I built my nuclear power plant, I built it right next to the uranium mines. And what I wanted to do in this series is build possibly two or even three nuclear power plants. I certainly want to build the twin reactor nuclear power plant. And therefore what I wanted to do is force myself away from that configuration of having the nuclear power plant next to the uranium mine. So the idea is, is all the uranium's concentrated in this area. There should be more than enough uranium mining capacity up here to drive multiple nuclear power plants. And the idea is, is that I'm going to have to build a town up here that will provide the workers to mine the uranium. And then what I probably will do is have the nuclear processing facilities here producing the fuel. And then what we're going to have to do is ship the fuel round to the various nuclear power plants. Well, that's the idea, but you never can tell. And that also leads on to a, another feature that I've put in, partly for the fun of things. And that is another little valley up here and again this has been put in deliberately just to provide a little bit of a challenge and an option and we're not saying that i will definitely use this but i've put this valley in here and there's probably enough space for a couple of open stores in here so that this will be my like you say depository of all the nuclear waste if i don't export it again i'm, I'm not saying that i am going to do it this is just options that i've wanted to put on the map just to make it a bit more fun and i think that covers all the resources and if i drag the map out here and just give a, a quick overview of the way that the resources are distributed you can see they're deliberately put in a pattern that will effectively put the preferred option to be either ships or aircraft but at the same time there will be options for rail and road because you can see there are pathways through the divide connecting up all the different components and bringing the resources together to produce the items that will result in a self-sufficient economy will present a challenge and one thing i do want to achieve in this series is to build a fully self-sufficient economy that uses all the available mechanisms in the game although that comes with one strong caveat in the sense that this series will run for probably quite a long time and there's always the risk that three division will release an update which will actually break the save game but uh, hopefully that will not happen and we will be able to take this map to its full-blown conclusion 
And what I'm going to do now is move on and talk about the starting location for this series. And it came down to these two at the bottom here. The one that gives access to the iron and steel. And this one in the corner, which has very limited resources. If I show you here, you can see that the, the only real resource that's close by is the bauxite. And in the end, I decided on this start. Now, some of you may think that's a bit odd. And there also might be one or two who say, yeah, we've taken the easy option. There's lots of open areas here, even if there's no resources. Now, the reason I've chosen this star is for a very specific reason. That is that I want to explore tourism as a way to generating early game income that will allow the expansion across the map to connect up to the other resources that will eventually lead to a bigger income. And I think by starting here, I can focus more on the tourism than rather trying to push out to gain a specific resource. One thing I will say about this star is there is actually quite a good gravel patch in here. But to be honest, I can't remember where it is, so I'm going to have to try and find it. So what we should be able to do is get a good construction industry going in some part of the map. Where it will be, I don't know. I haven't really thought much at the moment about how I'm actually going to build up the starter town in here. And of course, if any of you followed, followed my series, you'll be aware that I like to build everything. So we'll be starting with the minimum number of buildings to get up and running, and then we'll be building everything else. Now, that approach does impose a major constraint, which I think became very apparent in the previous series. And what I was trying to think of was a way that I could allow the economy to expand very quickly and effectively be able to get at least like the steel mill working before about 1990, I can't remember, and not be up in the year 2000 when I'm getting the oil supply put in. And what I'd like to say is a big thank you to MessDP. I think that's how your name is pronounced. And it's M E W S D P twice, who posted a comment that triggered a thought process which makes incredible sense even in the context of the restrictions of the way I like to play. So what we're actually going to be doing in this series is we are going to be starting here. We are going to build up our starter town to the point where we're going to be getting a reasonable income. And then what I'm going to do is once that income is self-sustaining, we're going to go up to, say, this location. It most likely will be this location. And then we're using the same rules I did to create the first starter town. We're going to build another starter town here with the minimal amount of buildings financed by the previous area and then build this up into a town which can, can then go out and develop the iron and steel industry and then what we're going to do then is repeat the process up here with the oil industry and build a, a town up here which we will then get an oil production up and running and hopefully by then I have a, a mature enough economy not to feel the need to use the exploit of exporting oil and then hopefully once these three areas are developed, what we're going to do is come over here and do exactly the same again, but with the NATO connection. So if I, again, if I draw the map up to full size, what, so what the idea is we'll have a town in the right hand corner, a town in the center bottom, a town up in the top left here, and another growing town in the top right, all working together, hopefully connected by aircraft and ships. And then what we can do is then effectively build in the rail network and the road network, join it all together, connect up these very resource rich areas in the center here, and also bring in the supply of uranium. So eventually it will all connect together and form this over embracing uh, self-sufficient society. So that's the idea. Whether it's going to work or not, I've got absolutely no idea. I've done very limited test play on here. In fact, the only test play I've really done is like confirming that the river is fully navigable and also some sample building for some of the more difficult buildings that, that have a big footprint. And I think this is where I'm going to leave it. Hope you enjoyed this video. And more importantly, hope you're going to enjoy the series. For anyone who may not be interested in the series and may look at this video for the map, it will be available on the workshop. And if you want to have a go, either to follow the series or just to put your own unique game style onto the map, feel free to do it. But until next time, whatever you do, enjoy your gaming.